time. We live in an image saturated culture. If a picture is worth a thousand words, then millions of words could have been saved in recent years or decades. Life magazine seemed to be on its way to mastering this medium even in the mid 20th century with influential photos summing up events for good or ill and projecting presumptions across our nation and our world. One such life photo captured my father jitterbugging with a young lady at a fraternity party in Auburn, Alabama, illustrating a life story on young adult social life. Never mind that my father had actually sneaked into that party as a high school senior. And now the evidence was available for his parents and the nation to see. Our image trafficking has only increased exponentially since then, and even since the rock band U2 toured the world's largest concert venue several years ago with a video wall behind them depicting many unrelated and distracting image loops for the duration of their shows. 24-7, 365 news programs and multiple video screens in most restaurants have certainly furthered the pixelation of our times. Remember eating in restaurants was a thing we used to do. <laughs> God made man in his image. Warning against our worshiping those of our own making. And Jesus used parables 2,000 years ago, casting the vision of his kingdom while protecting it from those who would distort it. Yes, Jesus was ahead of his time, in a sense, even while seeking to redraw you and me in that original human image of God. He spoke of his kingdom's stealth campaign of increasing influence, like a mustard seed and like leaven. He spoke of the massive value of his kingdom, like that of treasure and exquisite pearls, recognizable to some, but not to others. And he cast the dragnet vision of the inescapable sobering importance of entering and being an active citizen of that kingdom. We might summarize these lens lessons of Jesus in these parables as follows. His kingdom is not superficially visible, is one lesson. Oh, it shows itself in a variety of ways. By their fruits you will know them, and so on. But the kingdom itself is superficially on the surface invisible. Secondly, it has surprising ability to grow and to spread its influence. Third, it is the source of true joy. Furthermore, it is priceless. It is priceless. The very treasure in the field, the pearl of great price, signify and point beyond their prices to the reality of their pricelessness. There is nothing worth as much. Fifth, Christ's kingdom must be personally 
appropriate. These are the lessons of these parables. Next, his kingdom may be entered from different kinds of circumstances. And finally, his kingdom is made personal by a transaction. All that we are, all that we have, all that we currently know ourselves to be, and all that we may come to know ourselves to be in the future, we give to him. In exchange, we get to enter. We gain his kingdom. The reign and rule of Christ in the hearts of individuals. And the binding and living together of others who have done the same. Priceless and yet gained by an ultimate transaction. I want to linger at that lesson about influence. The life of Jesus of Nazareth itself illustrates the power of that influence from the humblest of origins to the most influential of lives. We too have our influence in our families and our communities in our churches, and yes, in our nations. The godly input and actions of Christian people are a blessing to, to the nations in which they live. There are other forces at work that also have influence, however. We are experiencing an example of that in our own nation this summer Concerning the events of this summer across our nation, I don't want to focus too often on it, nor do I want to ignore it. I have made passing references to it in a few sermons this summer, not daring to go too deep or to linger too long. And I'm afraid that if I continue to do so as we move toward the combination of an election year, or the culmination of an election year, that I may sound too political. Allow me a moment to speak directly about a particular concern I have, and I will try to leave it there altogether until after election day. And it has more to do with uh, the social and economic and civic fabric of our nation than it does really with politics. But as the weeks and months move toward November, the political will overshadow everything else. And so I want to speak now about something and then just try my best to leave it alone uh, until after that time. Very briefly. While an election year exaggerates things and produces unusual phenomena like an extended full moon, I am concerned that some of the otherwise good reminders about our national life together this summer are being drowned in a sea of distorted images. I am concerned that there is a trend toward slowly embracing the social and economic model of Marxism. Now, I want to avoid being a conspiracy theorist. I remember as a child being taught about the various constellations in the night sky. Some of them were clear to me, the Big Dipper and a couple of others. Some, though, seemed, even to my young mind, as quite a stretch. There might be two or three stars, and we were supposed to believe that it was a hunter going forth to hunt, or a horse, or any number of figures. I saw that some ancient imaginations may have gotten carried away. 
connecting dots or stars where there were so few. Of course, that was before I had glasses, so maybe I just wasn't seeing the stars. Those we call conspiracy nuts do a similar thing, expanding a couple of coincidences into an elaborate diabolical scheme. But like the Big Dipper, it is possible for the number of dots to be so numerous and connectable that one begins to wonder which is more foolish, to begin to think of conspiracy or to refuse to do so. World history is, of course, replete with such things. Allow me to briefly speak to the appropriate Christian angle of input concerning the superiority <coughs> of capitalism in a constitutional republic to Marxism. That appropriate Christian angle, or the appropriate angle of Christian input has to do with, first, the doctrine of original sin concerning fallen human nature. Secondly, a covenant based on God-given human rights and freedoms. Third, the value of servanthood. And fourth, the reward for honorable treatment of people, i.e. customers. Capitalism in a constitutional republic takes these realities into account while Marxism, which can seem promising on the surface, either ignores or runs roughshod over them. Jesus was ahead of his time, and he was amazingly influential. Let us, as members of his kingdom, as those who would enter, remain, and be active citizens of his kingdom. Also, be influential in our families and communities, in our churches, and yes, in our nation. I wonder if Jesus ever did the jitterbug. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of your hearing and reading and reflecting upon, indeed internalizing, living, living out your word. We pray that you would instruct us. We pray that you would lead us, that you would inspire us, that you would comfort us, that you would encourage us, that we would sense your call, that we would know your nearness, and that we, we, we would bring your kingdom to bear in ways that are wise, in ways that bless the most people. Lord, we lift to you those of our church family who have struggled of late, who have been dealing with various illnesses, surgery recoveries, test results, indeed the loss of loved ones. And Lord, we thank you for your heart that ever beats for your people. We receive, O oh Lord, your care, your ministry. We pray, O oh Lord, for your healing hand, for that special touch which strengthens and brings healing in our lives. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would redeem the time and that you would enable us to do so even in these special days, Lord, we do ask that you would lift the burden 
of this virus and of this plague from our land and from around the world. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would utilize it for good in our lives and others, and that you would bear us through it in the midst of its challenges. Thank you, Lord, for each person represented here and each family. And Lord, we seek now to pray together the prayer that you taught your followers, saying with our brothers and sisters around the world and throughout the ages, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come, thy will, thy will be done, done on earth, earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, the fellowship, communion, and power of His Holy Spirit abide with you now and always. Amen. God bless you.